This week in AI, Google took a huge step toward a truly personal assistant that can connect across your Gmail, photos, YouTube, and search, while OpenAI got hit from multiple sides at once. A messy talent boomerang K drama with thinking machines, Elon Musk's lawsuit gaining momentum in public once again, and a massive Cerebus compute deal that hints the next ChatGPT generation GPT. 5.5 won't just be smarter, it'll be dramatically faster and harder to compete with 5,000 tokens per second. So let's talk about it. First, Google launched personal intelligence in Gemini yesterday, and it forces a rethink of what personal in AI actually means. This isn't about Gemini suddenly becoming smarter than everything else. It's about where the understanding comes from. Because up to now, most AI assistants have worked in a fairly limited way. Even with memory features like OpenAI's ChatGPT, mostly know what you've told them directly. If something lives in an email, a photo, a receipt, or a calendar event, you still have to go and find it and bring it to the conversation yourself. Every new chat often means explaining your situation all over again. Google is trying to remove that step. With your permission, and the feature is off by default, Gemini can now look across parts of your Google account, like Gmail, Photos, YouTube History, and Search, and connect information that's already there. Not just pull it up, but actually reason across it. That changes how the assistant behaves. Instead of waiting for you to explain things, it can fill gaps on its own. A service receipt in Gmail combined with a photo can surface something like your car's tire size. Old travel photos with paired booking emails can shape new trip ideas. A YouTube video you watched weeks ago can be linked to an email thread discussing the same topic. In one X post that's already been widely shared, Gemini remembers a haircut appointment from December 2025 and offers to help you book the next one. In contrast, ChatGPT cannot access external data, responding only that no prior chat mention exists and requesting manual input for future reference. What makes this feel different is that it mirrors how people actually think. Most of us don't store our lives neatly in folders. Information is scattered. We remember pieces, not file paths. We waste time searching because the context exists, just not in one place. An assistant that can quietly connect those dots removes the kind of friction we've gotten used to. At the same time, it's impossible to ignore why Google can do this so effectively. Google already holds a huge part of people's digital lives. Emails, photos, searches, videos, it's all there. Once an assistant starts using that history in a helpful way, switching to another AI becomes less appealing. Not because other models aren't capable, but because they don't know you in the same way. That's where the real advantage comes from. However, Google is clearly aware of how sensitive this is. They've emphasized that personal intelligence is optional, that users can choose which apps are connected, and that everything can be turned off again. They say private emails and photos aren't used to train base models, and that there are safeguards around sensitive topics. Still, one system reason across your personal history is a meaningful choice. The usefulness is real, but so is the dependency. But Google is not the only one toward personal superintelligent. Meta has been circling similar territory with what many informally call personal superintelligence, though without a clear label. OpenAI is also building towards a personal super assistant vision, but without a native ecosystem like Gmail or Photos. Reaching the same level of personalization likely requires partnerships, operating system access, or new hardware strategies. So Google, for now, is the first to put a name on it, personal intelligence and back it with an ecosystem scale execution. However, there's also a deeper question underneath all this. Understanding. As assistants become more personalized, people will want to know why something is being suggested. Where did that idea come from? Which part of the data influenced it? Can I reset or clean the slate if I want to? Trust doesn't just come from controls. It comes from feeling like you're still in charge. This move also fits into a broader pattern. On the same day personal intelligence rolled out, Google announced VO 3.1, bringing image to video generation directly into Google Workspace. With it, static images can be turned into short videos inside tools people already use for work without jumping between apps or learning new software. A product image, a slide, or a rough idea can quickly become a short clip that's ready to share. This fits the same philosophy. AI isn't being positioned as a separate destination anymore. It's being woven into everyday workflows. Whether that feels exciting or uncomfortable depends on how much you trust the company behind it and how confident you feel that personalization is working for you. Now, when people talk about future GPT models, something like ChatGPT 5.5 responding at 400 or even 500 tokens per second, it can sound exaggerated. 
But OpenAI's recent deal with Cerebrus Systems shows why that kind of speed is now technically plausible. OpenAI has signed a multi-year agreement, reportedly worth around $10 billion, to secure up to 750 megawatts of specialized compute capacity from Cerebras. This deal isn't about training larger models. It's focused on inference, the part of AI that generates responses in real time. Every GPT reply, code, suggestion, and agent action happens during inference, and that phase now dominates AI workloads. According to estimates from McKinsey and Company, inference accounts for roughly 60% of total AI compute usage today. As AI systems move from experiments to everyday workloads, responsiveness becomes critical. A capable model that feels slow quickly becomes frustrating to use. Cerebras approaches this problem differently from traditional GPU clusters. Most inference today relies on many GPUs connected by high-speed networks, which still introduce delays as data moves between chips. Cerebras uses a single wafer-scale chip that integrates compute and memory on one massive piece of silicon. By avoiding constant data movement across multiple chips, latency drops significantly. Research cited by IEEE shows monolithic designs like this can cut communication overhead by 50 to 70 percent compared to multi-chip systems, leading to faster, more consistent responses. Like NVIDIA's partnership with Grok, this deal signals a broader shift in AI infrastructure. Major players are building dedicated low-latency inference layers using specialized or non-GPU hardware, rather than relying on GPUs alone. For OpenAI, this speed enables more natural conversations, smoother long-term reasoning, and practical real-time agents. It also improves efficiency, allowing more users to be served with less power. The takeaway is simple. The next leap in AI won't come from smarter models, but from infrastructure designed to make those models feel instant, even at massive scale. And while all of that is happening at the technology level, the human side of AI is getting messier in the open AI talent drama. Earlier this week, Thinking Machine sent out a company-wide message from Mira Murati. The message basically said, Barrett Zoff is no longer with the company. He was let go for sharing confidential information in an unethical way. And Samith Chintala is stepping in as the new CTO, effective immediately. At the time, people assumed this was just another internal leadership shakeup. Nothing too unusual. But one hour later, people started noticing something weird. Barrett Zoff's name suddenly popped up again, but this time on OpenAI's side. Along with him, Luke Metz and Sam Schoenholz were also showing up in welcome posts and internal ORG chatter. Basically, three former OpenAI researchers had quietly returned. Fiji Simo, an OpenAI executive, posted a welcome message saying something along the lines of, thrilled to have Barrett, Luke, and Sam back. That's when people started connecting the dots. Based on what the timeline seems to suggest, it looks something like this. Earlier in the week, Barrett has a conversation with Mira about possibly leaving Thinking Machines. A couple of days later, Thinking Machines fires him, citing unethical sharing of confidential information. And then, almost immediately after, same day or next day, OpenAI publicly welcomes him back, along with the other two researchers. So naturally, the internet went into full speculation mode. According to Wired Reporting, Barrett was already sharing confidential information with OpenAI while still at Thinking Machines, and that the company found out and fired him for it. Others think he was already in the middle of negotiating a return, and Thinking Machines pulled the trigger once it became clear he was on his way out anyway. At the same time, the legal pressure on OpenAI keeps building. Elon Musk reignited attention around his lawsuit against OpenAI this week with a short but pointed post. He replied to a Kelsey prediction market link the one tracking whether he'll win Musk v. Altman et al. by January 2027, and wrote, I've lost a few battles over the years, but I've never lost a war. Kelsey's screenshot showed the odds climbing to 41% as of January 14, 2026, right after a U.S. district judge allowed the case to proceed toward a jury trial. The lawsuit itself is Musk's argument that OpenAI broke its original nonprofit first commitments by moving toward a more commercial structure and partnerships, and he's seeking damages tied to what he calls ill-gotten gains. OpenAI and Microsoft deny the claims, and OpenAI's side has argued timing and statute of limitations issues. So who will eventually win the lawsuit? In court, OpenAI probably has the advantage. These kinds of nonprofit mission lawsuits are hard to win outright. But outside the courtroom, Elon Musk is already winning. He's forced attention, pressure, and scrutiny on OpenAI. So legally, OpenAI may win. Practically, Musk is already getting what he wants. But what's your take? 
Let me know in the comments. And if you want the real story behind the world's fastest moving AI breakthroughs, make sure to like and subscribe to Evolving AI for daily coverage.